Hello, 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 hello. Good afternoon, Belkut. Ching Han turns with zeros. Antonio Montes. I mean, Formula Q1. How are you guys doing today? Hello, Ando Bear. Hello, hello, hello. That guy who stinks says, Ay! That's just what I imagine you said. I'm trying to get um, some emotes for the channel. Somebody already sent in a suggestion. Jack, good afternoon. Link Gage, Hakadoo. Hakadoo to you as well. The Wally emote win. Okay, so I'm working on a Wally. If you want to submit an emote, what you have to do is you you send me a picture and it has to be like a relatively small I don't know like 200 pixels by 200 pixels or something like that um, meerkat how do we, uh, wait I already read that hi Nookus hello the shoot hello D Stratus yeah so let's see let's let's see I mean, and and the emotes have to get approved. Let me show you. Okay, this is the one. Liam, yes, you submitted uh, our this year. This is uh, Dr. Rehanian, and he's um, reflective. So I don't know, I, I submitted these this morning. I don't know how long it takes to get approved. Um, we have this one. The Batman mask. Good afternoon, Krishna. We have... We have the space buns. Some of these are just random electronic stuff. This was what I was thinking for Wally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what you do is if you have an emote that you think would work, you send me a picture and then I submit it to this website and then they have to they have to approve it so this one's like awaiting approval pretty fun though so I hope those get approved the Sun is out today it seems like it's been a month since we got any sunlight so I'm happy that the sunlight is here. And that's all I have to say about that. Sun's out, gun's out. You gonna get out the tank today? Uh, Belkit says, Among Us Sus emote would be great. Oh, I like that. You should make that emote. Hank. Good morning. Stay inside because it's cold. Mike just got back from a run. Very nice. I highly approve getting outside when you can. It makes a big difference for me to just get outside in the sunlight Take a walk. It feels good. 
Ooh, Ando Bear is getting in some skiing. I haven't gone once this season. I need to do that. Trogdor just finished sanding my future nightstands. Nothing beats being outside. That's awesome. Doing some woodwork. Pika Pika, you'll take your cat on a walk. There you go. All right, are you guys ready to get started? Trugder practically made all of their furniture. That's impressive. I'm jealous. What's up, Kate? Happy to see you. All right, people, we're going to go through some flow charts today. So get this ready, because I think this is this is just going to provide a nice bird's eye view, give you some context for what we're doing this summer, this spring. And we're going to start with this flow chart right here. Actually, maybe I'll make this a little bigger. All right, so we're going to start with this blob. And this represents a real life thing that we want to control. In this case, it is we want to control this blob. Nick Tommy says, hi, everyone. Hello, Nick Tommy. And let's say. I know these look like the jumpers that you put on your your car, but we're going to uh, what they represent are sensors. Belkit says, "Will the completed notes also be uploaded to UB Learns like we had in 454?" Forgot to ask that last time. Yes, I will upload these notes. Although I will say, um. The notes that I had for road vehicle dynamics, they were very, very clean. Like I had more time last semester to really get in there and make those look lovely. The notes that I'm posting this semester for digital controls, I'll do my best. But I think basically what you're seeing me write right now will be what's posted online. So I will post the completed notes. Okay, so these represent sensors. And um, let's say, just for the sake of this example, that these are measuring the, the height of this blob. Maybe imagine it floating in the air. And I'm going to call this height Y as a function of time. And somehow those sensors are measuring the height. And these are being monitored digitally on a computer and we have some measurements at discrete points in time so you see this little graph that uh, Pugsley is monitoring there and let's just say that we're getting measurements from this blob once every second so these little dotted lines represent one second increments and maybe I get this height measurement, one second, another second, another second, another second. So that's what coming off, that's what's coming off of these sensors and being recorded digitally at discrete points in time. All right, so we have the sensors and we're also going to have this actuator. And this is what we're gonna be using to push around this blob in the sky to do what we want it to do for whatever controls task we have in mind. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna, there's actually two flow charts on this page and I'm gonna bounce away from this one and we're gonna come down to this bottom one for a little bit because I wanna talk about controls and then we'll come back to this top flow chart. So, okay. So here's the blob, and you can see it's kind of like in transition. It's moving somewhere. 
And what this represents is as a controls engineer, you have to have some desired behavior in mind that you make a control system to achieve. And uh, we also can call this reference behavior. But it's essentially the task that we have for this blob. Hello, that guy who stinks. Hello, sleepy apple. I love the names that pop up here. And um, let's call R of T our reference signal and I'm gonna I'm gonna plot this let's say that our goal is um, we just want to levitate this blob so we're measuring the height of this blob let's say I have a desired height as a function of time so I'm gonna space out these one second intervals again and I'm going to say, well, this is what I want the blob to do. It kind of has this linear trajectory, and it's just smoothly moving up in the air. That's what I want to happen. Okay. So we know that, as I described earlier, we have some sensors actually hooked up to this blob, and they're measuring the actual height. And as I showed earlier, I just kind of made up some data. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little graph again. But let's assume this is what we're actually measuring. And these are at one second increments. And let's just say it's kind of like bobbing up and down in the air. All right, up, down, up, down. So there's a difference between the actual measured behavior and the behavior that we want. Okay, so what we do in a feedback control system, you've probably seen this before, is we take these measurements, y of t, and we move them along what we call this feedback path. And we take this reference signal, let's call it r of t, and what we do is we compare the two of them. I compare the desired behavior to the measured behavior. And this junction right here is called the summing point. And you can see there's a plus on the one side, there's a minus on the other. And what happens at the summing point is I have plus R of T, whatever the reference is at a given point in time. Maybe it's this one. Maybe right now we're at our second sampling point. So this is our second point. And I subtract the measurement at that time. That's what happens at the summing point. And what we get is we'll call it E. But basically it's the error. It's the difference between our desired behavior. Amin says the error. Perfect. It's the difference between our desired behavior and the actual behavior. So coming out of this summing point, it's E of T, and we're getting a new E of T every one second in this example. So that gets fed to this red block, which is where we're gonna spend our entire semester basically. This is our digital controller. And um, the goal of the digital controller is to take this error signal and decide an appropriate control signal. So in comes the error signal, out comes the control signal, and the variable that we typically use is u of t. And this control signal goes to the, the 
actuator. Meerkat Finn says, is that a T in front of R of T in the summing point equation? And Pika and Kate said it's a plus. And they are correct. This is a this is a plus sign right here. Thank you guys. All right, now the logic that the digital controller uses to take an error signal and turn it into a control signal, that's called a control law. And I'm going to show you the control law that's on the balancing robot we introduced earlier, who I refer to as Wally, in danger of violating copyright restrictions. Okay, so this control signal goes to the actuator and then what actually interfaces with this real life system that we want to control, which is the blob, you have some actuation signal. Okay. Now, this is going to bring us to the importance of modeling, which is what the flowchart up above is all about. Because when you design a control law, the goal is to minimize the error between your desired behavior and the actual behavior of the system that you're measuring. So you're designing a control law to eventually make these two signals become very close together because that means the system is actually doing what you wanted it to do. But you have to have some understanding of the physics of the system in order to make good decisions about that. Okay, so now we're going to go back up to this flow chart up above. So we want to design a control law, but we need some understanding of the dynamics of this real life thing. So I'm going to show you two paths to get to a model. And we're going to start with this top path over here. So this light bulb, this represents, ah, I know how blob works. I've taken physics and I know the physics of blobs. So, I mean, for mechanical systems, often we're using Newton's laws. Kate says, that's the best overview of a feedback system I've ever had. And I took systems analysis last semester. Hey, I'm so glad. I hope it's uh, useful to you guys. Um, some of this one I'm stealing from Dr. Joe Mook as well. So he, he kind of inspired me with some of these flow charts. Okay. So... You might uh, say, okay, I know Newton's laws. Force is mass times acceleration. Um, and so, like, I have a force applied here. I can write some equations for that. Or maybe, um, maybe this is more electrically controlled. And you know your electromagnetism. You know Maxwell's equations or whatever. But anyways, using physics... Hank says Mook is a mad genius. Love that guy. He really is. He He's, I, I really look up to that guy. Whoa, did you guys just notice how the voice to text on the bottom of the screen just doubled in font size? I don't know how long that's been happening. Uh, but we're just going to roll with it. Okay, so you write some equations down on paper and what you, the type of mathematical model, which is an abstraction of reality, by the way, nothing is in reality is really perfectly modeled by math. I don't know if you guys can come up with a counter example, but <laughs> the font is actuating, says not in space. You're, you're right. It is becoming self-aware. It's like, pay attention to me. Um, anyways, a, a model is an abstraction of real life behavior. There's a quote, I forget who says it, but um, 
the quote goes like this all mathematical models are wrong some are useful so we know that our mathematical model it, it won't perfectly describe reality but we hope it's pretty close and useful but when we use physics we come up with this type of model it's typically a continuous time uh, and, and I'll put differential equation in here because we're talking about dynamic systems and things that change with time we use differential equations a spring mass damper block on a frictionless surface oh is that an example of something that we can exactly model but I don't know can we actually create a frictionless surface we can get close right sounds like a quote from blues clues good grief um, okay so there are different types of continuous time differential equations and so I'm gonna have these little blobs off to the side represent the different types so and the little picture kind of goes with it this one this kind of wavy surface represents a partial differential equation so we use these for modeling fluid dynamics maybe the vibrations of some flexible membrane so like oh man i don't want to get off on a tangent here but there are cool satellites that people are looking to develop uh, that use the principle of solar sailing have you heard of solar sailing it's like a boat on the ocean which uses a sail to catch wind but these are in space using sails to catch solar wind anyways you need these super long flexible panels and they unroll they kind of like roll them up and um yeah they okay solar radiation pressure thank you kate um but it's tricky because oh solar wind is different okay thank you thank you but they unroll these huge panels in their their light they're flexible and they actually vibrate and so they they've done a bunch of scientific studies on like modeling those equations how do these things actually like vibrate out in space and how do we control them so those are partial differential equations. Uh, this one represents a nonlinear differential equation. Now the picture that I drew here is a ball and it's like rolling over these hills. And you can see like if I release this ball, it could either go to the left and settle there or it could go to the right and settle there. And so it actually has two equilibrium points. Um, a fact about differential equations only a nonlinear differential equation can have more than one equilibrium point like a linear differential equation it has one equilibrium point and that equilibrium point is at the origin uh, if there are space sailors are there also space pirates yes and it makes me want to watch cowboy bebop it's been a couple years Okay, so that's another type of uh, system. This one, this is like a slider crank mechanism. And so this shaft rotates around in a circle and you can imagine as you do that, this block is gonna slide left and right. So this is a dynamic system that has some constraints on the motion. Um, and so we call these ones differential algebraic equations. Yeah, don't forget the space cowboys. Okay, but this next one, this is the most popular type of continuous time differential equation, which is very, very useful. And if you've taken dynamic systems, this is the type of differential equation we study. L-T-I-O-D-E's. Do you remember what that stands for?
linear time invariant that's the LTI and then the ODE ordinary differential equation ordinary just means it's not a partial differential equation and these types of differential equations they model lots of linear circuits linear mechanical systems and let me tell you this even these different types of systems up here they can be approximated with a linear time invariant ordinary differential equation at least over certain operating conditions so we like to use these because we have a lot of theory that characterizes the behavior of these systems very well. We can talk about the stability of these systems, the settling time, overshoot, blah, 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 like on and on and on. It's just very well characterized. Turns with zero says everything reduces to a spring mass damper if you try hard enough, LOL. Yeah, it's true. You go down to like the quantum level. Isn't chemistry spring mass damper systems just I don't know if there's chemists here who who disagree I know everybody likes to say that theirs is the fundamental uh, science um, okay so in order to control a system you have to have some idea about its physics and uh, so so this is one way to, to generate a model let me tell you a drawback. Okay. Not in space yet says, am I just a spring mass damper? I actually have a really, I, I have a philosophical riff on that. And it's related to Laplace's demon, which some of you have heard me talk about that before. But that's actually not just... That's not a meme, okay? You, you can actually get into that. Um, okay, so here's the catch. If you want to model something this way, you need to know all parameters in the model. Like, let's say, let's say that I want to control this spring mass system just as a simple example and let's say there's a real life spring mass system that this corresponds to I need to know the spring stiffness I need to know the damping coefficient I need to know the mass if I want to control the real life system that this is associated with now that might be simple enough for a more simple physical system but it gets more and more difficult the more realistic the system gets. So let's talk about uh, our friend Wally again. All right. So if you if you look at this guy, um, there's a couple things. Like let's say we wanted to control Wally. Um, so we need to know the mass. Let's just list a couple things. Uh, we need to know the inertia of the wheels. We need to know the moment of inertia about the wheels. We need to know um, some physics of the motors that are driving these wheels. So... Um, some things related to that, like the resistance of the motor, the torque constant. And these things you can measure, but it's it's not always easy. It's not straightforward. And as I'm going through these items that I would need to model on this robot, this is kind of me looking outside in at how I would make an abstraction of this real life thing so, but there may be some physics going on here that um, 
that we're missing. Physics that we're missing. Like you may think you know what you see in front of you, but in real life there might be something off. Like for example, there might be some manufacturing defect that makes the left motor different from the right motor. I mean, I guess I could look at them uh, independently and measure those, but um, there's there's also some non-linearities. Like if you've worked with motors before, you know there's what we call a dead zone, where for low low voltages, this motor won't spin. And then if you keep increasing the voltage, it gets to a point where suddenly it will spin. But for low voltages, it doesn't do anything. And that's a non-linear behavior. Um, so my point is, even if you have a nice, clean mathematical model on paper, when it comes to, okay, well, let's make this model correspond with a real life thing, you're going to have to do a bunch of measurements and, and those are often not easy to do. So this is, this is one type of modeling and this is the catch if you want to make it behave like a real life system. Let's talk about another type of modeling. And this is near and dear to my heart because I spent a lot of time um, uh, studying this. And this um, is a purely experimental way of getting a model for something. And we'll just call it what it is. System identification. Now I know a lot of you have taken MAE334, that lab, and some of what we do in there is system identification. Where, here's how it works. Let's say here's a box and inside of this box is the dynamics of our system. But we can't see in there, I have no idea what the physics are. However, I do measure the outputs. So let's talk about this blob here. Let's say I have no idea the physics of a blob. Well, at least I can still measure something coming off of it. And let's say I know how much force this actuator is applying, then I also know the inputs going to this. So what system identification does is it comes up with a model that makes sense of these inputs and outputs. The way I like to describe it is, um, yeah, Ando says black box systems. That, that's a way that we describe this. Um, you guys have all done some sort of curve fitting before. In your in your career like maybe you had a set of data and you did a linear fit you found the line of best fit that describes this data so system identification is just like that except it's curve fitting this is the way to think of it it's curve fitting for dynamic systems it finds the system of best fit to make sense of your dynamic data. So just like you can have an equation of a line, mx plus b, you can come up with a differential equation where it finds the parameters that best fit. All right, and the type of model that comes out of system identification, it's different than physics, which gives you a continuous time model. This gives you a discrete time model The reason is, in real life, at least when we do this with computers, you're grabbing measurements at discrete points in time. Like in this example, I said every one second. So this model is going to relate how the dynamics of this system progress at one second intervals. And if I gather data, uh, Kate says like with Bode plots, exactly. Exactly. So Bode plots, we'll do this really quick. A Bode, well, like one test that you can run, let's say um, I have my blob here and I have this actuator hooked up to the side. What I can do is I can force this blob back and forth 
using the actuator at different frequencies. And I can see the dynamics at those different frequencies. When you do that, you can build a Bode plot and you know, it looks something like this. You have, um, you have frequency on the X axis. So that's the different frequencies you tried to push this thing at. And then on the other axis you have, let's just for simplicity, we'll call it like the amplitude of the response. Like how far did it make the thing move back and forth? And so for all the frequencies you tested, you can look at the amplitude that resulted and it's going to make some shape. Like there's some common shapes that we tend to see uh, out in nature. And based on the shape of this plot, you can see, oh, this is going to be a second order system. And, and I can map a second order system to this that generates a similar curve. So that is a type of system identification as well. Um, now, so th this is one way to get a model. And notice, I don't have to know anything about the physics. I just have to run some tests that relate inputs to outputs. And the type of difference equation that we work with in this class, it's like an LTI ODE, but um, a little different. We're going to work with a linear time invariant difference equation, not a differential equation. Now, if you were to take um, the top path in this flow chart and you use physics and you get a continuous time model, it turns out you can transform that model into a linear time invariant difference equation and vice versa. It's kind of an approximate relationship, but the reason I point that out is in practice, often we don't just do one thing or the other. We'll probably do both types of modeling and we'll learn from both paths that we take. So, ooh, this is kind of fun to zoom out and see the flow chart as it's developed. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, what I wanna do is I want to go to our next set of notes. Estes, I'm running out of room, says Pika, Pika, Pika. I know. I know this this page is a little jumbled but but we're not going to put any more on this page okay so um so we're going to move on we're going to go on to the the next handout which has this similar flow chart kind of at the top as you can see i was a little ambitious here i thought we were going to start with this one today i was wrong That's okay though, we're not in a rush. We're gonna get everything covered. So the flow chart, bird's eye view, kind of abstract. I want to relate this flow chart to the balancing robot that we've been looking at, AKA Wally. -E. Okay, and let's start over here. Drawing all these pugs is getting tough for me. I gotta print next time. Well, practice makes perfect, and drawing a pug is a worthwhile endeavor. So let's talk about this balancing robot. And we're going to start with desired behavior. That's the first task when you design a control system. You have to know what you want the system to do. So let's draw this thing. That's its wheel. We're looking at it from the side. And let's say it's like tipped over just a little bit. And it's deviating from vertical an angle. Let's just call that angle theta. And 
other than that, we'll also say that the rate at which it's falling over, so like d theta dt, let's just call that omega. So we'll call this theta the pitch angle, omega we'll call that the pitch rate. And actually the control's goal in terms of the reference behavior is straightforward for this robot. We want it, if we just want it to balance, let's say that theta r, so I'm saying r for reference, I want it to be, let's say, zero degrees. I want it to stand upright. And let's also say that the angular rate, the reference that I desire, is that it's, it's zero degrees per second. No matter if I tip it over, whatever, I always want it to come back to this. Okay. So that's our desired behavior. Now let's, let's come over here. So what this robot measures, I think I mentioned last time it has an inertial measurement unit on it, an IMU. And uh, so one thing that it directly measures is this pitch rate omega and let's just make up something let's say at a given moment in time it's 10 degrees per second so this thing is starting to fall over um, another thing that the imu measures is uh well i mentioned the acceleration and they, they kind of cheat here a little bit. Let's zoom out here. So it's a three axis accelerometer. And so um, it can measure acceleration like in this direction, in that direction, and then maybe like going into the page or coming out of the page, whatever. And I'll just make up some variables. Like I'll say that's acceleration in X, acceleration in Y. Now, something you remember from the MAE334 lab is we calibrated an accelerometer as one of the labs. Meaning, um, we put it in different orientations where different gravitational acceleration was acting on the accelerometer. And then we, we looked at the measurement that came off of that, whatever. My point is, If this thing is tipping over slowly, oh, did I do a left-hand coordinate system? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, from these accelerations, if this is staying still, you can deduce the, the angle, the pitch angle. But if it's moving then you have inertial acceleration superimposed on the gravitational acceleration and it doesn't exactly give you the angle all that to say the the only the only thing i wanted to say is that they have some way of measuring the angle and i'll put a little hat on there because they're not directly measuring the angle they're using the acceleration to kind of deduce what the angle might be and let's say like right now at this sensor measurement it's 10 degrees and and let's put a subscript k on here because this and this will mean it's the kth measurement the sampling rate on here, it's somewhere south of 200 samples per second. Maybe it's around 150. I'm not totally sure. But anyways, it, these measurements are happening at discrete points in time. So what we do is we have a, a reference and we have the actual measurement. So we're going to have some error signals coming out of this summing point. So uh, let's just call this like E1K because we're going to have two of these in this case. 
So let's have my reference angle minus my estimated angle from, from the sensors. And let's have E2. My reference, which is just zero, minus my measured angular velocity. And these go to the digital controller. Okay, but before, because I'm gonna show you the actual control law on this robot, because it, it's open source software. They, they tell you everything. But before we get to that, let's talk about the model for this robot. I'm kind of going to make something up. I'm going to show you a difference equation. Not a differential equation. And there's nothing special about difference equations. I'm sure you've seen them before. But let's say this is the difference equation that describes the dynamics of this system. So the angular velocity at some step k is, let's say it's 1.1 times the angular velocity at the time step prior plus 0 0.3 times maybe the angle at the prior time step. And let's add one more thing. I'm gonna call it u. And what this is, is the voltage to the motors that are the wheels. Now, every difference equation when we're talking about dynamics, this model is specific to a certain sampling frequency. So, uh, because these talk about consecutive steps in time, but how much time elapsed between these steps? If this is a long amount of time, well, we know the robot would have fallen over. So let you have to specify what sampling time this actually corresponds to. And let's just say it's the 150 hertz model. If the time in between each of these steps is one divided by 150 seconds. Now, if you look at this model and like just if you're trying to make physical sense of it, think about this. Like, um, this is saying, what is my angular rate right now? Like, how fast am I falling over? Well, it's saying that it's going to be 1.1 times how fast you were falling just a little bit ago. So this means like, well, as I keep falling, I fall faster and faster as I tip more and more. And this is saying the more tipped over you are, well, even faster you're going to be falling. And then, um, and then this will just be whatever we provide. Why are the units in brackets? Oh, I just, I just tend to bracket them off so it's clear that I'm indicating units. It's just a stylistic thing that I do. Okay, so let's say this is our model. And let's talk about a control law. All a control law is, is what you define. Link says, is there a way to determine the largest time interval without falling over? Probably. But as you'll see, there's many, many, many different ways to define a controller for this. And depending on how you do it, the time interval would be different as well. That's a great question. All right, I'm gonna make up a control law just so you see how this would work. Making a control law is defining what the control input should be. The control input in this case is the voltage that we decide to give to the motors. Um, actually, I'm gonna show you what their control law is first. Let's pull this up. We're going to go over to a different screen. 
Okay, this is one of the files in their code. As you can see, there's quite a few different lines here, but there's one line of code that I'm interested in right now. And it's this one. And I can explain it to you. So this is their control signal. What they have here is this variable angle zero. What this represents is the reference angle. And I think they call it zero because, um, is this Arduino code? Yes, it is. Or wait, I think it's C++. But this all operates within the Arduino environment. This is a header file. Um, yeah, so, so this is the reference angle. This is the reference angular velocity. Not in Visual Studio, VS Studio. Wait, wait, what is, I'm gonna embarrass myself. I know it's one of the IDEs. Notepad is the superior IDE. Um, okay, so here are the reference. And then this Kalman filter angle, this represents the angle that they estimated. Did I already explain Kalman filter? No, 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 no. All you need to know about this is this is their estimate of the pitch angle of the robot. And this right here is their estimate of the angular velocity rate. Yeah, Mike says it's probably just getting rid of some noise from the sensors. And it looks like the gyroscope they're not using the raw measurement from the sensor. They're also using a Kalman filter on that, which is common practice to, to get a sensor measurement and it's gonna have some noise and, and you filter it. Okay, so what these quantities in the brackets are, these are the errors between the desired dynamics and, um, and what, the, what our best estimate of the dynamics actually are. So this is an error term. And then this one's an error term. And then the um, control input is some constant times this error, and then another constant times the other error. And up above, you can see what they define these constants to be through like some kind of tuning that they did. But they're just, they're just numbers. So KD is 55, blah, 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 blah. So, so let's say I have, okay, this model for the dynamics, and then you can see that the control law is like, let's just call it K1 times E1, which we defined above, just the difference between the reference angle and the measured angle, plus K2 times E2. And what's happening on a digital controller, and, and I showed you, it's just one line of code. All the analysis we do kind of boils down um, UK minus one and not UK. Oh, great question. Um, actually, to be consistent, like these should just be K minus one as well. Um, I guess it's, it's kind of arbitrary. Well, okay, so for the dynamics model, this current quantity is related to quantities from the previous time step and for higher order models it could even depend on time steps beyond that like k minus two three time steps prior whatever um but this k minus one is just saying that my angular velocity right now depends on what you set that voltage to uh prior so i'm just staying consistent with that because what you would do is you're designing this control law such that when you substitute it into this model, the dynamics behave the way you want. And in this case, we want omega over time to be approaching zero. Um, and, and part of our control process is going to be, well, how fast do we want it to approach zero? And, and we're going to 
um, we're going to precisely define it with dynamics. Uh, let's see here. All right, we're, we're at 130, but but this is basically what I wanted to show you. I wanted to give you an idea of this is how a digital control system works. We get measurements at discrete points in time and based on the information we have, we design a control law that feeds some command. Um, will there be a different control law for theta or is it the same? Well, I think in this case, because theta and omega are just uh, theta, I mean, the angular velocity is the derivative of the angle itself. So if I design a controller that, that guides these dynamics the way I want it to be, then that will also um, dial in that theta parameter. What are K1 and K2? Oh, these represent constant multiplying factors. I know the, the Ks, I'm using a lot of K, that might be confusing, but uh, we call these control gains. Proportional, yeah. So you have a proportional gain factor, a derivative gain factor, and I think that's the kind of notation they used in their control law, actually, let's see. Yeah, they have the KP, proportional gain times this angle. And then they have KD, the derivative gain times the angular velocity. They call it derivative because um, we're multiplying by this gain is multiplying the derivative of the angle error. And it's, I guess it's a little arbitrary. Um, it, it depends on what you define the, the coefficient to be like the, whichever is the proportional one, then everything kind of goes from there. <clears throat> when using time steps, it's also easy to make the derivative of the position. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So that is where we're going to pause today. I know we're so so next time we're going to pick up right here. We're going to go into signal types, define some terminology, and then I think we'll get through this and then hopefully we'll get to this example with Fibonacci's rabbits because I think it's really fun. Um, so we're starting to get into the meat in the coming days. Trogdor, thank you. Thank you guys for your attention. Thanks for your participation. This is a lot of fun for me. I hope you're enjoying it as well. I hope you're getting um, some good info. V1111111 says, do we have a lecture for the 334 lab for the first week? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So we'll meet on Friday. We'll talk about how the class is going to go. Shrek says your class is fun. Hey, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy it. Um, yeah, this is this is fun. I'm glad you guys like this. Pika, do you think uh, we're still on schedule for the first homework on Friday? We'll see. You know, I might we I might put it out on Friday anyways. Like the first homework is going to be covering some difference equations and stuff like that. So it, we won't really be getting in, into difference equations in the theory until we get to this example. So the homework one is kind of dealing with this. Can we get it today? It's not quite ready yet, so I can't give it to you today. I, but, but I don't have a problem with giving it out early. So I'll, as soon as I have it ready, I'll put it up so you guys can start looking at it. Brandon says, when is the lab? On Friday? So 
for this course, we don't have a lab. I know when you sign up as a graduate student, um, I think it does say lab, but um, there is no lab with the digital controls class. We just have the lecture. Can I get the homework when I'm not enrolled in the course? I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I don't know the best way to get it to you. Maybe on the Discord? But I'm limiting the Discord to students just so it's like kind of more insulated. I have to think about that. Send me, send me, um, send me a message. <sighs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna hang around for just a couple more minutes to see if people have any more questions. Other than that, have a great rest of your Wednesday. Maybe get some sun, take a little walk, bundle up. Kate says, thanks Dr. E, have a good one. Thank you, Kate, have a great day. Pika says, thanks for the lecture, dope jacket. Thank you, thank you, thank you. See you Friday, that guy who stinks. <laughs> uh, thank you, guys. Good stuff. Adnanana, thank you. You know what we can do in the meantime? I'm getting into chess. I'm starting to really enjoy it. Hey, see you, Hank. Particularly, I'm enjoying the puzzles. Can I play you? Sure. You want to play? My, my account on chess.com is just uh, Dr. Estes. Okay, let's do a puzzle. So puzzles, you just have to choose what's the what's the next best move. And wait, what do I? Oh, okay. So if I move this knight. The queen, the king's gonna be in check. Um, but where do I move the knight? Oh, maybe here? Cause then I could take the rook? No! Uh, okay. Okay, okay. What about here? Oh, that, I, what about, uh, no. Guys, what do I, what do I do? Wait, what about, ooh, what about, oh, that's a better move. If you go to live chess, you should see a notification for me to play. Wait, is live chess different than chess.com? Try F3. F3? Okay, what's my next move? Quaron, you have some questions? Yeah. If you have questions, what, let me know. Your questions um, are more important than uh, my chess game. So just hit the play button on the left sidebar. Oh, I saw it. Oh, my goodness. I have a feeling you're going to kill me. Wait, how much time? Oh, this is a five minute game. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh. 
No, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, let's 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 do that. Okay. Let's work on it. Not Croft. Welcome. I'm just playing somebody in chess, a, a, a classmate. Uh, Quaron says, I signed up super late and missed the first class. So just wanted to know if there was a way to watch the first lecture. Yes, there is. Oh, I'm glad you love the class. So the way you watch the, the lecture is on Twitch. There you can go to, actually, let me, let me try to navigate there right now so I can show you. Oh wait, I should go to my Twitch channel. So this is where we are right now. I'll mute this. If you click on, if you click on the Dr. Estes logo, uh, you don't have to do this right now, but let's see where it goes. It'll, it'll show you videos. And when you go to videos, you'll be able to see the lecture from, from Monday. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that compliment. So, so you can come back here. Uh, also, you can also go to YouTube. And then if you just search Dr. Estes, you go to this one. And then you'll, like I upload the, the lectures there. So you can find it, you can find it there as well. Okay, so I probably have like no time left. Okay, let's go here. And now you're almost in checkmate. No, let's keep going because I think you're gonna destroy me anyways do you play breath of the wild on switch that's that's funny i uh i just started playing breath of the wild i did um, okay i'm gonna do this No, this is this is perfect timing because I gotta, I need to eat some lunch. Oh, I know what to do. Not prof. I I came to your class earlier today. Um, and I really liked your discussion of velocity. Okay, if I do this, Now you're, now you're finished. Now it's game over. Now it's just, now it's just done. Um, okay, let's do. You tried not to move too fast in the discussion of velocity. Wow. You should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, Quaron says, I'm gonna log off now, but I hope you have a good rest of your day. See you Friday. Hey, have a great day. Okay, let's, oh, I'm in trouble. Let's do this.
Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, no, no, no. I don't like what I'm doing. Oh, you logged in a bit late today, but there was some discussion going on about uploading a picture. Can you please repeat that? Oh, I was talking about emotes for this channel. So if you have like a, an emote, like you can see in the chat right now, there's like that cap of face. We can make emotes for this channel. So if you think of something that you think would be good, um, just shoot me an email with the picture. I know I only have 44 seconds, but you're you're just done. That's true. We already have some custom emotes, including the classic. Oh wait. Gotta attack. Gotta. Gotta attack. Okay, now I need... Oh my goodness, this is bad. This is not... This is not good. Gotta move, gotta move, gotta move. Okay, what I love is the game report. Let's let's see what went what went well and what didn't go well. Okay. Hey, thank you for the game. We'll have to we'll have to play again. Ooh, wait, what was the best move? Oh, okay. Very nice. All right, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to go enjoy some food. Adios.